Hi, I'm Tom Prager. I've had a long-standing interest in ultrasonography that even preceded my having white hair. While we're going to discuss B-scan and immersion biometry, the bulk of today's discussion, along with video vignettes and the still picture library, will cover the UBM, or ultrasonic biomicroscopy, or high-frequency ultrasound, and its usefulness as a diagnostic tool with a lot of clinical applications. With the UBM, you'll be able to look at very subtle details of the interior segment. And also, when paired with the clear scan cover, a single-use balloon appearing accessory, you can look at lesions on the side of the eye, directly on the eye, back about 10 millimeters or so, as well as look at subtleties in the interior chamber. This is an FDA-approved device, and it makes the old shell and gel technique obsolete, as well as providing advantages of sterility and comfort. I think the biggest use of UBM is going to be in the glaucoma patient, where you can visualize the angle, the scleral spur, and also structures back behind the iris, such as the ciliary body, to denote whether it's rotated or not. These will help in your tre treatment decisions. Um, inspections of posterior structures aren't possible with coherent light technology. The advantage of ultrasound is it's relatively inexpensive to buy these units. It's a fast setup, and you can look back behind the eye. So, I want you to consider using the UBM for sulcus to sulcus measurements, for implantable contact lenses, as well as for determining the presence of synechia, cysts, clefts, retinoschisis, and melanomas that may have invaded the ciliary body. We hope you enjoyed this video. Quantile Medical offers two types of UBM probes. There's the sealed 25 megahertz unit, which is filled with oil, in contrast to the 50 megahertz probe that must be filled with distilled water prior to use. Each of these units require a different fill method when using the clear scan cover. Note that uh, peer review literature shows that the sterile or sanitized clear scan cover, which is pressurized, to be safer than the open shell, and referring to the shell and gel technique prevents accidental probe contact with the cornea and is more comfortable than the open shell technique. Further, the clear scan is an FDA approved device. With the 25 megahertz sealed transducer, the probe body has a parting line. In other words, two pieces of plastic joined together which must be sealed to prevent leakage of water from the clear scan cover. A simple, flexible sheath is available that stretches over the probe body covering the parting line. The sheath is tubular and fits tightly over this parting line at the lower aspect of the transducer. The no-cost sheath is durable and will last six months or a year, if not longer. When using a clear scan cover with the 25 megahertz sealed probe, the bag can be filled with either tap or distilled water to the bottom of the clear scan ivory ring with the clear silicone seal facing upwards. It's very important in filling that the seal be facing up. In addition to providing a water bath separation between the cornea or the side of the eye and the probe tip, upon transducer insertion into the bag, it is now pressurized, minimizing the likelihood of the probe making direct contact with the eye. Note the clear skin cover is a sterile or sanitized unit intended for single use. Prior to use with the 25 megahertz probe, a line is drawn on the side of the clear skin cover with a magic marker. This permits accurate alignment with the white line on the probe. This will be very important for identifying image orientation correctly. The important point is to realize that whatever structure the white line faces appears on the right hand side of the display screen. In other words, when examining the right eye, if the probe line is directed toward the nose, the right side of the screen will depict nasally located structures and the left side of the screen will show temporal structures. Again, when filling the clear scan cover, the silicone gasket is the insertion side and also functions as a release valve. This is critical when ingesting internal bag pressure, especially in the patient with low interocular pressure. In summary, the proper fill technique for the sealed probe does not necessarily require sterile water, but the bag should be about 75 to 80 percent full. It's recommended to pour water slowly into the bag, minimizing the formation of air bubbles. Align the white line on the side of the probe with the line on the clear scan cover. 
line marking is not necessary for the newest 50 megahertz probe as the line has been moved upward for easy visualization. It just takes seconds to accomplish the fill and insertion steps. Appropriate bag pressure prevents denting of the cornea, an important point to remember because not every patient has the same interocular pressure. Changing bag pressure can be accomplished in several ways. For correct probe insertion depth, inspect the side of the filled clear scan that has been affixed into the probe. A good starting point for examination is when you can just see the white line peeking out from under the ivory collar. The goal is to create a conical bullet shape to the bag, which is optimal. Overpressurizing will cause the tip to swell, making the examination more difficult, especially if the lid fissures are narrow and in patients with low intraocular pressure causing corneal denting. The overpressurized and extended probe tip will prevent a complete sulcus to sulcus view. Recall that the inner silicone ring functions as a relief valve. Another way pressure can be quickly reduced is by holding the filled clear scan firmly with one hand and sharply pushing the probe to one side. You readily see the bag wrinkles after instantaneously expelling air from the bag, hence indicating a lowering of bag pressure. Also, the probe body can be pulled up slightly from the bag collar. This 50 MHz probe is a revised model and the white line has been moved upward so it is not necessary to mark the side of the clear scan. If the bag appears bulbous and overpressurized, the conical bullet shape, which is optimal, can be achieved after reducing pressure by pushing the probe against the internal seal of the clear scan to expel water and air, or unscrewing a set screw on the side of the probe body to release excess water. If necessary, try pushing on the bag at the upper aspect near the ivory collar. Recall that the bag is sterile, so avoid touching the tip. Once you have achieved the optimal bag shape, replace the set screw. In performing UBM examinations, have the patient sitting up in the same orientation that the eye care specialist would examine the patient. This should overcome problems in measurement accuracy since ocular structures such as the iris and interior chamber may be subject to gravitational changes when the patient reclines. Knowledge of probe orientation is necessary to correctly label your echogram. The white line on the side of the probe body indicates the direction of the linear movement of a motorized nub. For examining angles in the glaucoma patient, the line should always point toward the cornea regardless of clock hour. The image captured on the screen will always show the sclera on the left side of the screen and the anterior chamber on the right. When performing a sulcus to sulcus measurement, the probe line will face the nose for the right eye and the ear for the left eye. The resultant echogram will be in the same orientation as if you were directly viewing the patient's eye. Make sure that the clear scan is centered on the cornea and bag pressure is adjusted to allow complete corneal coverage. Patient fixation is important in the sulcus to sulcus examination. I use what is called the faux speculum method to maximally open the fissures. In the hand holding the probe, curl your last three fingers to pull down the lower lid. The thumb of the left hand pushes the upper lid up to the bony brow. For sulcus to sulcus ultrasounds, look carefully at the eye, making sure it is centered and aim the conical bullet clear scan tip at the center of the pupil. It just takes seconds to obtain a perfect sulcus to sulcus scan. The image itself is smooth on the corneal surface implying that the vector forces are even and spread over the first surface of the cornea. One disadvantage of the open shell technique, aside from being uncomfortable, is tinting of the cornea is noted due to excessive force of the open shell on the sclera bending the apex of the cornea, the thinnest part. Tinting affects the reliability of sulcus to sulcus measurements. This is eliminated with clear scan cover technology. When examining angles, the probe line is directed to the cornea. To scan the temporal angle, 
had the patient look slightly nasal, 3 o'clock in the right eye. Continuing, when examining the inferior angle, the patient looks superiorly slight, 12 o'clock. For the nasal angle, the patient looks slightly temporal, 9 o'clock, and when examining the superior angle, the patient looks slightly downward, towards 6 o'clock. When capturing this beautiful picture of the temporal angle, keep in mind several things. Make only micro-movements, up and down, left and right. The pupil is an important landmark that should appear in every angle in sulcus to sulcus echogram. Let's study the inferior angle. The patient is directed to look slightly superior, following my finger which is used for fixation. The probed white line faces the cornea. Make small, almost micro movements with the probe on the eye so that the pupil appears on the screen. It only takes a second or two to obtain an excellent echogram that is much more comfortable for the patient and easier on the examiner than the open shell technique because the bag is gently covering the sclera. How to identify the scleral spur in glaucoma patients? The scleral spur is the gateway to the interior chamber and an indicator of whether the angle is open or closed, but often the spur is difficult to identify reliably. Note, there is an acoustic discontinuity between the scleral and uveal tissue, producing a dark line on the echogram. The spur is located somewhere on this line. Using the calipers under tools, measure one millimeter back from the transition interface between the cornea and the sclera. Then draw a straight line down where, and where it intersects the scleral uveal line is the approximate location of the spur. The example in this picture shows the angle to be closed. Here's another echogram taken with our model showing that the angle is open. While the 25 MHz probe might have reduced resolution compared to the 50 MHz probe, it has the advantage of further penetration, an important benefit when trying to identify the posterior capsule on the phagomorphic patient. Even with less resolution, the examiner will not miss the presence of significant pathology. In the video example, the scleral spur angle is completely normal. At the end of the UBM examination, throw away the clear skin cover as the possibility of transferring microorganisms from patient to patient is real. A study showed that this is potentially a problem. 34 subjects had both eyes examined by UBM using the clear skin cover. Following ultrasound, the tip of the clear skin was swabbed and sent to the pathology lab where 80% of the 34 patients grew microorganisms associated with either enophthalmitis or keratitis. Scanning a patient. Your first scan, regardless of diagnosis, should be a transverse scan to determine if the fovea is intact. The fovea, responsible for detailed vision, translates to quality of life for the patient. The probe line faces the nose, right eye, transverse scan, and the transducer is close to the limbus with sound being directed to the optic nerve. When performed correctly, the nasal retina is at the top of the screen, a black V or the optic nerve is in the center of the screen, and just on the other side of the nerve is the temporal retina, the location of the fovea. Is the fovea thickened or detached? With the patient looking down, cup your right fingers that are holding the probe and make micro movements. I'm setting the probe with two fingers of my left hand. Generally, I drape the trans